Okay, so this is um, summer uh, three, 2018, Josh Reynolds, UHD, social work. Um, so we're covering chapters four, five, and six. And uh, the last uh, video was about a half an hour, 35 minutes. That's too long. I'm gonna try to keep it to more like 20 minutes, which is maybe five to seven minutes per chapter. Give you one concise example of how this works in the real world. Um, and that way it'll add some um, kind of flesh out uh, what the chapters are talking about. It's a good book. So this is chapter four, and what I should have done last time, and I'll, I'll do for these um, for these other chapters, is actually pull from the PowerPoints, which y'all have as well. So you don't just have to look at my ugly mug, um, but also you can see exactly what kind of we're pointing to. Okay. So this is HBSC Human Behavior and Social Environment, chapter four. Um, and so this is week two. So week two is chapters four, five, and six. So there we go. Uh, so I pay attention to this eco map. Um, it's it's a really mapping things out from a top down perspective is really helpful, and it's not necessarily things that we don't know, but just seeing them from that kind of twenty thousand perspective makes a big deal. So we're not covering that, but I would anything that has kind of uh, that kind of infographic or map that shows from a top down perspective how this could work and how you could use it, what needs attention, um, and provides a framework. I, I find to be very very helpful. Pictures are very helpful, and that one's particularly good, right? Okay, so. Um, one of the things that I want to give you here is an example of this. So, so this chapter talks a lot about family patterns, and that's really helpful. Um, but what does that look like actually in social work in Houston? And so a program that I was um, uh, on kind of steering committees and that kind of stuff for a few years uh, was a program out of uh, uh, Baylor, uh, and the Veterans Administration had a shared um, center where they did uh, kind of uh, community-oriented research. Uh, so programs that they would kind of test out in the field, which is great. And one of these programs is something called um, a calmer life, a calmer life. And you can guess that it was about um, stress and anxiety. But we, uh, the program learned very quickly to not use the word stress or anxiety because those would stress people out, but to call it worry because stress is a clinical condition on the DSM. Uh, but worry, we all kind of worry in our own life, so it's not as stigmatized, right? DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, uh, and that is what how you do like diagnoses for mental health disorders, uh, like bipolar or schizophrenia or different things like that. Um, and so, and so, anxiety and stress are in there. And there, worry is the same thing. Worry is what we all go through. So this was a program around helping older adults, so seniors, so people 65 and up usually, uh, stress less in their life. And when you have less stress, you know that you live healthier and happier and longer. Stress can kill you. Can also kill your quality of life. It can make you not think straight. It can cause all sorts of health concerns. You all don't need me to tell you why stress is a bad thing, right? Okay. Uh, so this program was working with older adults with senior citizens to help them reduce and manage their stress and anxiety so they can live longer, happier, and healthier lives. And the program was called A Calmer Life, uh, like calm like a sea, right? And so a calm sea you live. So you can kind of see what it was about. So as this program was recruiting, it turns out that a lot of the folks that um, they were recruiting were coming from health fairs and that kind of stuff and, and uh, different other nonprofits too. But a lot were coming from churches. And because it was focused on specific uh, neighborhoods in Houston, a lot of folks, a lot of older adults were coming from African American churches, uh, from Baptist churches and others. Like half, half these churches are Baptist, the other half were not. So about maybe like 85% of the participants, 80 to 85%, were coming from, and churches are a great place for clients because if you get in and they trust you, then they'll, they'll tell their friends. Um, and because of that, um, uh, most of the clients that uh, participated in this program were older African-American women, some of whom were widows, uh, some were still married, some were not married at all or whatever, but um, we had a lot of older African-American women. And one of the things the program learned to do over time was um, when you talk about the tools that you use to reduce your stress or anxiety, you're talking about the tools that matter to you. So not just breathing, you know, and exercise and, you know, all that kind of stuff, mindfulness and meditation or whatever else. But also, what are the tools that matter to people? And to um, most, um, uh, almost all of the African-American older women in this program, uh, their spirituality and their religion was a big part of who they are and a big source of comfort to them. God, as they conceptualized God, was a big source, is a big source of comfort to them. Because we're recruiting from churches, that's not surprising. Uh, and because we're recruiting, uh, the program was recruiting from African-American churches, specifically because of these zip codes, and because the churches were welcoming, um, for the most part, um, and even some of the churches actually sat on uh, kind of like the committees for this. So I got to meet some of the pastors as well, right, that were in the churches. 
spiritual because of all this spirituality is very important to uh, most of the program participants because of their demographics because they were African American older women who were members of this church which is how they found out about it, are these churches in these neighborhoods so what that means for what we did in terms of providing cultural competence I think there's none uh, cultural competence is actually next uh, next chapter so we'll talk about that in a minute but one of the things that the program did is it started incorporated the idea that if looking to God is one of your sources of strength, then you should absolutely use this as part of the program. So when you talk about your tools to reduce your stress and your worry, your worry that you're, you're praying or you know going to church or worshiping or whatever your process was, should absolutely be part. It was not mandatory, of course, but it was a helpful tool for the people that found it helpful. And, um, and so with other populations, this probably would not have been an appropriate thing, even as an elective to suggest. But for this population uh, that work with, again, not just an African-American population, but an African-American church-going older adult population, uh, for a lot of older adults in general, uh, depending on the culture, but a lot of older adults, the church is still the main thing in their life, right? It's still kind of like the center of their community. That's where you go on Sundays and sometimes on Wednesdays or depends on whatever, but that was really important. So, um, so part of understanding the family patterns is understanding how those kind of ecosystems and communities work and then working in their beliefs and what they care about into the program, not as mandatory because not everyone uh, is down for that, but as an elective part, if this is important to you, uh, and it is to some people in the program, but if it is to you, here are some tools that you are already using that you can use to be successful in this. And when the program started becoming that receptive to the social values and the mores of the families and the communities that they were serving, the program was serving, uh, then it became much more successful. So the number of women that, um, people, but older women mostly, that, in, that uh, had less stress, uh, the numbers went way up, the stress went way down, all the, all the measurables, all what we call the outcomes, went way through the roof. And also people were in the programs longer too because they were able to manage their stress and not have um, these kind of uh, health conditions that would lead to these you know, health challenges that, they, that meant they had to drop out of the program. Everyone liked to be there, but liking the program is not enough. It's how do you take care of your health? and your family, and if you have young children in the house, and transportation, and all these barriers to service. By drawing from this inspiration for this population, it made it more likely that people could complete the program and complete it successfully. So that's how you would use an understanding of cultural competency and the way that specific cultures uh, act and interact. And by the way, you never just go off this stuff because it's on paper, right? And of course, what this is talking about is a lot of the negative stuff in the family patterns. Okay, stats are stats or whatever, but there are so many wonderful things about every family and every group that you can either be part of or work with. And so you want to take the positive stuff as well. Because you can't just go and say, well, y'all, you know, blah, 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 blah. And that's all that stuff may be statistically true. But what else is statistically true that's good, right? Is their beliefs, the strong religious orientation the church provides? That's actually what it says right here, right? The church provides support. So if you know that about the groups that you're working with, and you can maybe think about using that. Okay, that's chapter four. See you a lot quicker, right? Chapter five. So culture has, culture can be used, the differences can be used uh, by the patriarchy to oppress people. And, that, and so, so language can be, obviously language can be a barrier to be used to help people back even accents, even where people are from, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, what I want to focus on is actually this first slide here, but society is changing, um, and, uh, and the old ways of doing things are going to die out over time, and we are much more pluralistic, and we're much more tolerant uh, than our parents' generation, and our parents are much more pluralistic and tolerant than their parents, and so on and so forth. And so we know, for example, that in Houston, uh, the majority, you know, there is no majority more. It used to be, it used to be white people, right? It used to be Caucasians, but now we're in the minority, and the largest single group, even though it still is less than 50%, uh, uh, I think the latest numbers that I saw are 43%, uh, 43, 44% uh, 43, of folks in this area in uh, Houston and Harris County are Hispanic and Latino. Um, uh, so the African American population is kind of staying right at between 15 to 20%, right around 18% of the total population. Uh, 
uh, the, his, the Asian population has grown from about 2 or 3% to 5 to even 7% in some areas. The Caucasian population is going down, and the Hispanic population is, is going up. And so what this means is the way that society looked in the 1950s is not going to be the way that it looks now in 2018. It's not going to be the way that it looks in 2030 or 2050, right? So what we say is demographics is destiny, which means if you look at, you know, if you look at the people coming into this country and also the babies that are being born, the future looks more like those babies than it looks like, you know, grandparents would have, you know. And so that means we're much more pluralistic, we're much more multicultural. And also, you saw this in the last chapter, but it used to be that only one or two or three percent of folks would identify as mixed race. But now, a lot of us um, have, especially our kids, right, have a, a lot of, um, uh, especially in places as, as multicultural and diverse as Houston, that, um, that we have a lot, that a lot of us identify as a lot of different things. We might have, you know, part European heritage, but also part Central American heritage, for example. And I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, but if, if, the, if the number of folks that are not only Hispanic are kind of doubling, and Asian are kind of doubling, but also the folks that identify as mixed race, mixed races or uh, blended families or however you describe non-traditional families in a lot of ways is growing. How will you create services to serve this growing population? And so this chapter does talk about, um, so one thing I want to say is, uh, there's no such thing as colorblind, right? If anyone says they're colorblind, they're uh, stay away from them or gender blind, right? I'm aware that I'm a Caucasian male, middle-aged, and all the other uh, cisgender, heterosexual, all the other demographics that are part of who I am. So if I say I'm colorblind, I'm an idiot, right? If I say I'm genderblind, I'm a total idiot. Of course you see all those things, um, and you recognize those, and you appreciate that as well, right? So if I say color, I'm colorblind, how would I... Uh, no to, in a program like Calmer Life, I did not run Calmer Life, but if I was running a program like Calmer Life, and if I was colorblind, then first of all, that's impossible. But even if it was possible, then that means I wouldn't be using a strength of the African American community, especially older African Americans, this was a program targeted at seniors. If I didn't recognize that I was, I was going to serve a lot of African American older adults, how would I create a program that has spirituality as a big part of it, if that's what they wanted to incorporate, right? It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Um, and, and so a lot of my students or most of my students are women and a lot are younger Latinas as well. So if I'm not, if I'm, if I'm trying to be colorblind or genderblind, I'm a bad teacher. You have to understand multiculturalism. You have to understand beliefs and attitudes. Not everyone falls into that, but that's kind of this, our culture is the starting place for who we are. We don't always stay there, but that's part of who we are. And if you don't recognize that, you're not going to be very good at SSS on your intervention. Um, and so uh, that's, I'm looking for one thing specifically in here. So, so one of the things to think about is different cultures, there are different ways to look at things. And the easiest way to look at this is maybe some cultures, individualism is, is how we do things. We're out for ourselves. It's called like a fixed mindset, right? There's only so much pie. So if you take two slices, then I can only have one slice, then I want two. And so it's always kind of like fighting, right? But there's always a collectivism approach as well. And that means we're not trying to eat a pie, we're trying to build kind of a fire that grows and grows and grows. So if you do better, I can do better as well. It's called a rising tide lifts all voice, voices, right? And so there are different cultures that do that do care more about collective, about we, than there are other cultures that say, well, we's okay, but it's really focused on, on me. And so you can even see how this plays into public policy. Are people like us or are they different from us? Well, that all depends on how we think about things as well. So if you look at individual, individualism, I versus collectivism, which is we, you can see a lot of what's happening on the national level of politics, which I'm not going to get into. But you can see a lot of that, and it, it may sound like racial language, and it is. It may sound uh, like classist language in terms of money, and it certainly is that. It may sound there are terrible gender things. Look, y'all, this is politics are not in a good place right now. Um, but that's because some of the leaders see it as, if they take more than I have less, and that's, a, you know, and that is individualism. I don't agree with that. I was about to say it's terrible, and it kind of is. But collectivism has its downsides, too. I think it's better, obviously, right? Uh, but there are different cultures where, where this is going to matter, right? And based on a culture's philosophy of what matters in life, is it me or is it us or we, you can really see how they create jobs, how they set public policy and laws, what the politics look like, and all that stuff. 
And again, not just because someone's, you know, just because someone is, is an, Af an African American, it doesn't mean that they are themselves a collectivist. Maybe they're a hyper capitalist and they're individualist. But their culture of origin has impacted them in some way. And the more that you know that, the more that you're able to work with them better as a social worker, whether in counseling and therapy, or whether in group work, or even like, even if they're like looking for jobs and your program offers job training, which a lot of programs do. Understanding how someone values work and what they think work is. Think about this in terms of generations too. This isn't in the slide, but a lot of y'all might be millennials or Generation Y or even younger than that. I'm Generation X and we think about things differently, right? So we kind of worked ourselves to death. We didn't really take care of our kids and we were pretty selfish about things and especially older Generation Xers. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm on the cusp of being Generation Y. But a lot of millennials and a lot of younger people, you value a balance. You want to have a life. I never wanted to have a life. I was supposed to work till I died, right? That's really dumb, but that's the way that my generation and generations before me thought. You do want to have a life. You do want to have a voice earlier. You're not going to wait your turn for the next 20, 30 years, right? I say wait a couple of years. Don't just do it in six months, but you got to do what you got to do. You're more likely to be entrepreneurial and to take risks just because of when you were born. So that's an age factor, age in terms of generations. So you can see where all the stuff, like where you are and what your kind of demographics are, really do impact. Okay, so that's chapter five, chapter six. So when you look at pastors' families and start to get into communities, um, um, so I'm going to regurgitate the chapter just for a second. What a community is are people that share something in common. It can be a geographic community, like a neighborhood. Or, and we talked about this before, right? Or it can be like an affinity community. People that share values. Veterans are a community. Social workers are a community. Um, women running for office, which there's an event that's coming up this week in, in my neighborhood of all the women who are running for elected office, regardless of whether they're a Republican or a Democrat or an independent or whatever else, they know that they're kind of part of a tribe. And the tribe is women that are still trying to break through. And in some ways, what still is a patriarchal world in a lot of sense, right? So this is so communities are groups that share values and or services and or institutions, right? So that could be like people who go to the VA or people that go to a certain like community center or people like, you know, basketball players or whatever, right? Or share certain interests, artists or geographic. I live in the north side, right? Near north side. So those are that's that's my community, right? Houston's a community, then even your neighborhood's a community. Um, but really, the two big types, one is the shared identity, and the other one is the location, the ge geography. Um, and so that's, that's, that's kind of the precursor uh, to talking about. Um, so one thing to think about is that obviously technology has changed the entire world, right? So a decade ago, believe it or not, it would have been completely inappropriate to text a client about their appointments. You just email them or call them or just do nothing, right? Now you always get a text reminder before any appointment that you go to, not just in a social worker or a, uh, or a setting that's like a therapy setting, but for a dentist. Or I just I went to an acupuncturist today for the first time for some neck problems I'm having, and we went ahead and set up the next two appointments. And as we were setting them up, after she hit the whatever on her scheduling app on her computer, it showed up on my phone, and it said, you, you, know, here, you, know, you have an appointment next Monday or whatever, do you want to go and put this in your calendar, right? That's something that would have never happened a decade ago. Now it's just standard practice. So technology has kind of changed everything, right? Um, so that's that's part of it. Uh, but also you got to think about technology has kind of divided us too. We spend a lot of times kind of like looking down at our devices, right, and not up and not seeing the world around us. We can kind of bemoan this, and but if you're younger, you'd be like, that's just the way that the world works. Well, now services have to be different. We, no one would have been caught dead providing uh, online services 20 years ago. Now I'm teaching this entire class online, right? You and I may never meet face-to-face -face unless you take another class with me. Now if I'm doing therapy, we might do therapy just online. And it may not even be like like uh, web, like web um, video chat. It could be like even text-based, or it could be email back and forth, or it could be through a system like Blackboard. So you think about how does this mean, what does this mean for communities? So now communities are less about location or place and more about the sense of oneness and identity. Think about the groups that you're on online. You think about the places you go and the articles that you read and the people that you identify with and, and the groups that you, you know, people that you talk to on Instagram or on Snapchat or things like that. 
what are the things that draw you all together? So before geography was the most important thing because you didn't leave your geography. You either stayed in your town or you moved out of it. Now that doesn't really matter that much because you can just get online and you can be chatting with someone across the world instantaneously. So it's more about the commonalities that we have together. So how does this impact services to kind of wrap it up? Well, what this means is if the services don't have a digital component, you're not really getting it. But it also changes how we think about communities because most people do think about communities still as my neighborhood or my geographic community. But now community is more about a sense of identity. And when you tap into that identity and who someone is and what they care about, and if you can relate to that, you're going to be much more effective in services. All right, that's it. And uh, I'll see you all for the next one.